Hi, uh, good morning everyone. My name is Saad Kadi and I'm the head of CERTU. I'm also the founder of the Hive project. And I have been working 21 years now in cybersecurity, what we used to call information security. And I would like to share my thoughts uh, on the sorry state of cybersecurity and what we can do about it. And since this is a little story, it has to begin somewhere. So, well, I chose to begin with certainly one of the first um, cybersecurity product I knew about, and that's the antivirus. So, does anybody know when the antivirus was born? 85, 86-ish? Mm -hmm. 97, 70, 90, 70, yeah, pretty close. Um, so, and in the beginning it protects us to some extent from um, a certain number of threats out there. So, for example, ransomware. So the first ransomware I know about is AIDS. It was created in 1989. It's not a new thing. And uh, Brain in 1986 contained some of the ransomware features. So basically AIDS came into like a disk that you had with a like floppy disk, um, uh, five inch, uh, with a PC magazine, and like it was distributed to about 20,000 subscribers. And of course, if you pay like the ransom that is, uh, was asked for you, they will kind of, you know, free your files. So not a new thing. Fileless malware, there is a lot of talk raging about fileless malware. Uh, the first I can think of is Slammer back in 2003. So that's what, like 16 years ago? Uh, worms, I love you. Uh, 2000, I'm not speaking about like on the uh, uh, Morris worm here because again, I'm kind of focusing on Windows. Uh, Nimda, Code Red, and also potentially unwanted applications like Mimikets. Of course, like a lot of antivirus there out there classify Mimik as a potentially unwanted application. I certainly don't want it in my network. Um, Trojan and rats, so, uh, so like the first Trojan or uh, Brad, I can think of is EJBTR, sometimes like 9089. Anyway, you get the idea. And this slide, normal life, will suffice to list them all. So, um, how we ended up here? Um, in 2003, Dan Gear um, published this paper, which I invite you to read. It's free, it's out there on the internet, called Cybersecurity, the Cost of Monopoly. How the dominance of Microsoft products poses a risk to security. And Dan Gear, back in the time, was working for At Stake. Um, and after publishing this uh, paper, he got terminated from At Stake because Microsoft was the biggest or one of the biggest customers of, of At Stake. Of course, uh, well, uh, a monoculture has advantages, don't get me wrong. I'm not like, hey, let's use like a, all sort of operating systems on our networks. This could become quickly unmanageable. Uh, even though uh, us as geeks, we would like to do good at like, like freedom, you know, all that thing about our culture. Um, indeed, so as I said, monoculture has advantages and the security of Microsoft products has significantly and steadily improved. So the shift began with when like uh, Bill Gates in 2000-ish said, okay, so now we have to do secure products and they uh, created the uh, secure development life cycle. So basically they applied it and we can see for example now Windows 10 has some very, very cool features. However, uh, monoculture means standardization and standardization leads to class breaks and class breaks are too costly for us to ignore. So class breaks 101. So this term was coined by Bruce Schneier back in 2003 uh, in his book Beyond Fear. So you get uh, quickly the idea. So an attacker basically targets a certain piece of software, compromises a certain device. In a class break, they uh, target a widely deployed piece of software uh, due to monoculture and standardization, and they end up compromising hundreds, if not thousands, of devices at once. Um, can anybody think of like a widely deployed piece of software there that we can compromise? Antivirus, right? Um, so, tons of example. Um, Symantec Endpoint Protection, uh, protection in 2016. 
so Project Zero, uh, Tavis, kudos to you, um, had uh, published this paper about how to compromise the in-price endpoint with uh, several critical vulnerabilities, so like a ton of them. Uh, and basically from 2012 to 2018, Google Project Zero more or less focused on the antivirus industry and found a number of highly critical vulnerabilities in many, many AV products. So Kaspersky, EZ, Commodore, Trend Micro, and so forth to just uh, list but a few. And uh, I also invite you uh, to read uh, this post from the register, uh, from the reg back um, in 2012, uh, and where like Tavis was really, really um, getting into like an argument with Sophos about like how secure or insecure the product is. So basically, if you target like uh, um, antivirus, uh, you can end up doing a, a nice class break. So maybe we need an antivirus to protect an antivirus, right? Um, so, but also supply chain attacks can be considered class breaks. So if you remember from 2013, uh, attackers compromised FASU mechanical services, uh, which uh, was considered their secondary target. From there, they stole um, a username and password for the VPN for the tar target, well, the, their primary target, so target the, um, the chain in the US, um, and they ended up uh, like hitting 40 million posts. Uh, over the holiday peak. Um, now imagine the same thing, like if instead of, imagine that FASU, for example, was the HVAC uh, like contractor, not only for Target, but for many others. So indeed we can there uh, assume that a supply chain attack would end up as a class break, where an attacker just compromise one target and end up uh, with a foothold in many organization. This is not theoretical at all. Um, and just one example. So two weeks ago, I think, uh, Christopher Glier, chief security architect from FireEye, tweeted from the FireEye summit that APT41 compromised uh, the company behind TeamViewer and which enabled them to access any system with TeamViewer installed. And um, for, for those who recall uh, these uh, art, art technical article from 2016, uh, saying that basically a lot of TeamViewer users who were hacked and they don't know how. Um, so is that linked? I don't have like a strong proof or confirmation, but probably is. Uh, we can also think of Wipro back in April uh, 2019 and many other examples where a supply chain attack um, ends as a class break attack. Um, so let's continue our march toward failure. So as I said, we had in the beginning the antivirus, so Fable with faulty sig uh, signatures sometimes calls BSOD, um, insecure because too many parses, and I think Ange has something uh, uh, around that uh, workshop. Bad coding, uh, it's also an excellent vector for a nice class break, uh, and also, of course, insufficient. So it covers only a certain class of threads. So with growing digitalization come product proliferation. So we end up with a cybersecurity product zoo. So UBA, UEBA, 2FA, Sandbox, Threadfeeds, TIP, NIPS, EPP, EDR. By the way, who, if you don't know what EPP is, like, I invite you to read, like, just Google EPP versus EDR. If you understand, please tell me later. Uh, NT Myerwell, uh, et cetera, et cetera, so you get the idea. And not only we have all this zoo, but I mean, like, if we want to make kind of sense of it, we just have to look at the RSA conference for next year. There are 470 exhibitors, right? So, like, at least 470 companies that paid a spot on the uh, exhibitor uh, floor of RSA, and probably they have some very cool tech powered by blockchain and AI, certainly. Uh, so, but what we keep forgetting is that like the antivirus, these solutions also are all part of the attack surface. And I'm just taking a few examples, very recent ones. So from 7th of October, source from the best VPN, they found out a pre-auth remote code execution in Sophos Cyber Room. So basically, if you purchase uh, Sophos Cyber Room for your VPN, right, I'm not speaking about NordVPN or, you know, all that stuff. Just, you know, we just went to the market, bought your with your own money this product so we don't even have to authenticate to you know exploit it get a foothold audit and you know just see everything right pretty practical um, if we take from 10 of october so in part perva blames data breach on stolen aws 
API key, oh, cloud. So if I read that, so like basically the improvised CEO said that after the company notified impacted customers of the security breach, customers, yes, customers changed 13,000 passwords, rotated more than 13,500 SSL certificates, and regenerated more than 1,400 Imperva API keys, right? So you buy a product and then you end up like doing additional stuff, you know. Um, and uh, also, um, Komodo, yeah, I really like Komodo because not only the antivirus was kind of um, had a, a lot of uh, high severity uh, vulnerabilities as proven by a Google Project Zero. They were, or their um, uh, uh, CA, their uh, certificate authority was hacked back in 2011. And very recently, I think in July and August, so their, the professional services team calendar of Komodo um, has been leaked to the web. So, and they are still in business, in very good business. Um, but all this stuff also run on top of vulnerable processors, right? So, yeah. Uh, if, well, Intel has some troubles, so, and we are still waiting for like a good fix for that. So, we, we, which probably not go through a patch, but basically just change the processors. Um, and our security products need humans and a lot of money to install, use, and maintain. So we just single out the SIM, okay? So being a cert, so we deal with the SIM, right? So for a SIM, so I have to buy the hardware, I have to have buy the software, I have to recruit sysadmins, I have to train my people to use some obscure query language. I can just like, you know, Google in my Splunk. Um, or I have to monitor the health of the system because it keeps losing logs from time to time. I have to configure log properly. Uh, no, it's not a fire and forget uh, task. I have to build and maintain use cases. I have to buy thread feeds. I have to buy a tip. I have to hire data scientists to look at after my data. I have to configure alerts constant, uh, constantly and hope my analysts don't die out of uh, false positive fatigue. Uh, I have to buy pro services because uh, there are always age cases and there are like my parsers that have like uh, for my uh, uh, my log files will eventually break because the sources of the log files at one point they will change the version they won't tell me about it and they will just like switch field from here to there so like breakage at scale um, well so we do have a serious layer eight problem right so we have the perfect recipe for doom and burnouts and I'm seeing more and more burnouts in our community so because we are you know, forcing upon us products that consider our brains to be like a computer. So they just like put stuff that we have to learn. So too many things to learn, too many things to defend, like attack surfaces exploding, including in our uh, security products, too little time to investigate. The, ch the tech is continuously changing. Uh, the threat landscape is continuously ch changing. Uh, we have continuous distraction and interruption because e besides email, they thought it's good to have like Microsoft Teams, like so to get notifications from all the people trying to reach to us, etc. And we have like WhatsApp and Signal, and so on and so forth. And there is also the fear of missing out because like. We really like our job and are passionate about it. And there is this, what I call info busy, because like, you know, not a single day goes, we have like have tons of news. Oh, have you heard about this? And there is this new tech and this new, new thing about like the cloud or Kubernetes or whatsoever, et cetera, and so on and so forth. Yeah. So hang on. Help is on the way. AI. <laughs> right. So, I mean, I've seen this ad from a company called Darktrace, and they dubbed themselves as the cyber, cyber AI, the world, yeah, world leading cyber AI. And they have uh, the, in this ad like a snake, you know, looking uh, at, um, I think uh, it's a leopard, and the leopard is defending its baby. So, basically, in the ad, I'm just seeing two predators fishing each other. And I'm not seeing like the victim there anyway. So, but they have AI. But, um, well, sorry to break down for you, but as uh, the gentleman before me said to, for, for cars, so artificial intelligence is nowhere ready to help us. Because for example, breaking currently the, the leading deep neural networks uh, is very easy. If you read this article from 9th of October for, from Nature, uh, it's very interesting, called Why Deep Learning AIs Are So Easy to Fool. They cite this very interesting research paper from Google and Cornell University called Adversarial Programming of Neural Networks. And reading that, knowing where a DNS weak spots are 
could even let a hacker take over a powerful AI. One example of that came last year when a team from Google showed that it was possible to use adversarial examples not only to force a DNN to make specific mistakes, but also to reprogram it entirely, effectively repurposing an AI trained on one task to do another. So AI programmed to defend me, to attack me. So, and don't forget that algorithms are created by flawed humans, us, uh, and trained on data of varying quality uh, while running on vulnerable uh, processors. So Desiree yesterday mentioned that, for example, lots of this AI for SIM and SOC, etc., it has to be continuously trained on kind of stable ground, like stable data, etc. Oh, don't change anything. I need to learn first. Um, this is exactly how life works. Um, so, how are we going to break, break the failure cycle? Of course, there is no cyber bug. So, bugs and security bugs in particular are a direct byproduct of our modern software development practices. And this is due to time to market. Uh, there is no liability at all. So, you pay like a gazillion money, but use as is and don't forget to pay. Uh, growing complexity, limited or non existent regulation for the vendors. Bad coding practices. And I also invite you really to take a hard look at the venture capitalist model. Um, I think two weeks ago in a Virus Bolton conference, Harun Mir, uh, whom you certainly know, uh, gave this very interesting closing keynote. And he described uh, the, the VC model to some extent and the video on YouTube. And I invite you really to look at it. So, um, and things are about to get worse, or are getting worse. So, citing here uh, Julien Véhan, the Fireworks Operation Security uh, guy at Mozilla, and author of Security DevOps, he tweeted um, a few days ago that the overcomplexification of provisioning in deployment pipelines is a dangerous trend. I don't trust the layers upon layers of scripts and tools to not break randomly, and I worry the maintenance cost is getting out of hands. Yes, I'm looking at you, Kubernetes. Um, and for example, uh, if you think about vulnerability assessment, like vulnerability scanners, so not only we have to do the traditional vulnerability, you know, um, uh, scanning, but we have trying to kind of figure out how we fit our tools into the CI/CD pipelines. And uh, when, like for example, a, a Docker is spawned and then discarded, how we can spot uh, their its vulnerability surface or its attack surface before like things uh, happen. So. Uh, and I believe we know the solutions, but they require a lot of courage and hard work to get implemented. So in my opinion, we have to start push back, pushing back. So we have to ask for more transparency from our vendors and suppliers. Uh, why should I use your stuff as is? You have to be li liable somewhere for your bad you know, coding or for like introducing vulnerability, et cetera, et cetera. So for example, let's take um, Operation Shadow Hammer. Shouldn't be ASUS liable for kind of, or at least responsible for securing the auto update um, infrastructure, not to be used by attackers to compromise many machines at once due to me activating auto updates. Uh, we also have to demand easy to use solutions. Why I have to learn every now and then, like new query languages on how, like, you know, those. Uh, Lengthy command lines over and over because somebody thought that it's better to do it that way than the other way. We also have to demand interoperability. Why we have like to get into um, uh, when, uh, a point where I cannot choose the solution that I want because it doesn't work with another solution that I already have in my zoo. Uh, we also have to leverage the power of the crowd uh, by empowering, for example, and helping law enforcement uh, arouse those cyber criminals uh, and also use and contribute uh, when applicable to free and open source solutions uh, that we can learn from uh, as well. We have also to help each other out and show how to do something and in return get, uh, you know, like learn from the others how they do it. Um, and um, also we have, and I, I mean like 21 years, in where it's not, not even there like just do proper patch management or just implement proper cyber hygiene. Um, in our case, we see a lot of incident that could have been prevented by just like proper cyber hygiene. I'm not even speaking about, you know, user awareness or like, oh yeah, it's the users and that. No, 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 just 
proper patch management or proper, you know, uh, secure cover, uh, configuration and hardening. Uh, and also we have to learn to use what we already have and stop using what we don't need. Thank you. Hi. So we're going to go to the coffee break, but we have time for a quick question. Uh, great presentation, Todd. Thanks. Um, there's been a lot of talk about information sharing over the years. Um, and vendors don't have liability. I've been scratching my head over the years why it is that um, out of our own sort of risk aversion within our organizations, we can't, within our information sharing communities, share information about which tools do what they say on the 10 and which ones don't. Uh, and I'm, I'm sure you, representing sort of you, you're never going to, within, you know, say, one of the trust networks you participate in, say, we, we brought in this EDR tool and it was total crap and they lied to us. It is but, exactly what we say in, the, you know, the trust groups that we are involved in, some of them at least, say indeed, like for example, in our know, team exercises, we have, you know, gotten around to this EDR tool. It's really crap. Uh, and it's basically, this is how it works. We have to share that and some, at some point, like vote for the, our own money because those solutions that are not working are not good enough. If we share about it, you know, not necessarily in public, uh, but at one point we drive them out of the market because they, are, they don't deliver the goods. Well, I applaud that and suggest that we should do more of that where we're able. Thanks. Okay, you're welcome. Uh, actually, that raises an interesting question. How how do you use such close information in uh, outside of the trusted community so you can you can make it applicable? For example, you know a certain tool is is well not deemed your money or your even your time, and when you need to talk with the other people, is it as well management? Is it politics and so on? How do you use this close information? And how do you translate into something that is more than words? And so uh, you and they can act upon it. Um, well, this is kind of a, uh, like there, I have no, I would say, magic recipe for that. But basically, in, in my case, I'm just speaking about my case. I don't know what the others uh, do. Uh, when I speak to my steering board or like the higher apps, et cetera, I just be very transparent on what like kind of products work, et cetera, et cetera. Hoping that these, do those director general, et cetera, would speak to commissioners or other like people that get their ear and maybe drive the, the, uh, like the message through. And also like whenever I have a chance, uh, to speak, to be invited, like to present the opinion of sort of you, of my opinion, etc. So I be, I am as honest and as transparent as possible saying, okay, so like, for example, there is a, this, this, this kind of thinking that AI will save the world. And I'm really weary, really wary about that. I'm not saying like we should not invest in AI. But we have to also to, to, to learn about its limitation. And just like, not because like being, we have, we are fed by some journalists, like some talking points, some vendor, et cetera. We have to challenge it because there is a lobby from the vendors. So I think our community should also lobby. So like to, to provide like kind of like counterpoints and make it have the decision makers and the policy makers have like have, have a balanced like opinion to see, okay, so these guys say white, the others say black. So we have to make a decision somewhere in gray. Okay, we'll just take two more, two more questions. So great presentation. I was fascinated by what you said um, about the venture capital model. So in, in the U.S., we have this problem right now where uh, the U.S. government is not investing in small tech startup companies. So 10 years ago, when all this, uh, the U.S.-based tech startups uh, were getting money, they were getting it from within the U.S. They were getting it through U.S. venture capital firms and, and from the U.S. government. Today, uh, like 75 or 80% of that is going to China. And so Chinese, uh, the Chinese government has changed their model. And now all this, uh, all these tech startups from the U.S. are now moving to Shanghai and Beijing and right, all these other areas. So, um, I'm, I'm interested if that same problem is, 
is occurring within the EU and how do we, how can the U.S. and, and European governments work together to, to fix this problem and, 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 uh, and really capitalize on all the great technology that, uh, that, that's homegrown, essentially? Yeah, well, uh, we can talk about that for hours, I guess. I, I cannot kind of it like in two minutes or like 30 seconds, etc. Yeah, but I get your point and I agree with it. And also, like, I keep also hearing about, like, oh, we have all this great tech in the, uh, Europe. But basically, like, whenever, well, in, in my experience, when I talk to some, like, of the big players, like, companies, like, uh, organizations, like, hey, why, why don't you invite in this, you know, like, this little threat intelligence shop out there, you know, in, in Europe, they do a good job from our opinion, etc. depending on your sector, etc. So, no, we prefer to purchase things from CrowdStrike because like, they are like in the magic quadrant of, of, of Gartner. So I think this is also a, a problem. And I think also the, the, like the VCs are kind of waking up. Well, I, I, I really hope that what, is, what, what happened with Uber and what is happening currently with WeWork, you know, and also we have this, well, SoftBank, you know, uh, thingy out there, and there is a very good article on Wired that was published last week about, like, how uh, the, the SoftBank, uh, you know, um, investment uh, model uh, has helped those kind of, you know, Europeans, unicorns happen in, in what, what we have currently in the market. So I hope that this would be kind of a wake-up call and we, we'd get maybe like better investment in solutions that actually work instead of just like, you know, pitching venture capitalists like I have AI blockchain and, you know, get a ton of money. All right, I have a question down here as well. Hi. So I'm very familiar with the um, vendor, their products don't work. In my opinion, it's basically a matter of how high is the, sh I mean, uh, technical debt piled per individual vendor. But my question to you is, what is the worst risk to an organization that the vendor products don't work or the accidental backdoors we've seen a lot in the last few years from companies like Cisco, Fortinet, and so on, where you have pre-auth RCE on critical infrastructure devices? Yeah, well, I guess the answer is it depends on the maturity threat model. So I would say that if you're like a, I would say as a baseline, I have to have some confidence in my products. Like in they do what they advertise they are to, to do. Like if I'm getting like, I don't know, like a, uh, let me give you an example. Um, the, a few years ago, uh, we, we had this, you know, um, mail gateway that was supposed to filter a lot of threats, et cetera, et cetera, and so on and so forth. And we had like a just, um, you know, a regular mass spam campaign, right? Uh, and we blocked zip files. However, we saw zip files delivered to the end users. And we were sort of scratching our heads. So how this is happening? So we like looking at the policy, et cetera, et cetera. Indeed, like .zip is completely blocked. Then we started look, looking into those zip files. Basically, the zip files were compressed with the non-default algorithm. And the mail gateway, it, it was trying to decompress them using the default algorithm. If it fails, that means it's not a zip file. So this is what we are talking about. Like this is, a, this is a three years ago. I'm not, you know, speaking about even AI or anything. So I think we should just have to have confidence that if I say block zip file, whatever, what the heck, you know, what compression algorithm you, you use, I don't have to care about it. I just have to have confidence in you telling me, okay, so I block zip files and that, that, that's it. And from that point on, of course, if you're like, Growing in maturity, et cetera, and have like a sin baseline, then you have to start to worry about like those unintentional backdoors. And you have to also find a way like to protect against them or at least detect them. As like investing in like kind of lateral movements, you know, like, you know, weird behavior uh, or like some threat hunting. But of course, there is no 100% solution. Okay, some great discussion. We got a coffee break now. It's, uh, we're running like 10 minutes late, so please come back in 10 minutes. And uh, thank you very much. Thank you.